I wonder what you would say if I asked you what imitating a godly example, the doctrine of election, and the return of Christ all have in common. And although it might sound like the start of a cheesy Christian joke, these things have two things in common. First, they are the predominant themes. These three things are the predominant themes of 1 Thessalonians. And second, Paul intended all of them to bring hope and encouragement to the Thessalonian Christians. So they're meant to bring hope and encouragement. And we will be working through this letter and then 2 Thessalonians together, and we will be thinking about how Paul uses these theological ideas to help bolster the faith of a church that is enduring times of suffering. So before we dive into this letter, though, we probably need a little bit of background to understand what's going on here. So Thessalonica was a major cultural and trade center of the Roman Empire, and we know a little bit about Paul's missionary work there from the passage we read in Acts 17 and 18. We know that Paul and Silas began their work there by engaging the Jewish synagogue for three Sabbaths. And it's likely that they they continued to preach after those three weeks outside the synagogue, as it seems from this letter that they are actually very familiar with this congregation, likely took a bit more time to build than just those three Sundays. And we also know from Acts 17.5 that the Jews uh, in Thessalonica brought some of the Christians before the authorities because they were jealous of Paul and Silas's success in ministry. And this upheaval pushed Paul and Silas to leave and go minister elsewhere. And yet still further we know from 1 Thessalonians 3 that Paul sent Timothy to check on the Thessalonian church. And it's likely that Paul wrote this letter from Corinth And his time there we read in Acts 18, around 49 or 50 AD, when Timothy returned with a good report about this Thessalonian church. Now, it's worth noting, I think, that this is likely Paul's first inspired letter. And this letter reveals that Paul was encouraged by the report about the Thessalonian church, but he was also concerned to encourage them during a time of oppression and give them reasons to maintain their hope in Christ. And that's going to be a a really leading idea throughout this letter. But now we get to get to the really good stuff, the the text itself. It's good to get, I mean, who cares about Greece and that sort of thing? We get to look at God's word And so in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 10, it includes Paul's opening thanksgivings concerning the church in Thessalonica. And the main point of this passage is that Paul gives thanks to God because there is evidence and fruit of election in the Thessalonian Christians. And that should Give them and us encouragement and hope through difficult times. So let me repeat that. So Paul gives thanks to God because there is evidence and fruit of election in the Thessalonian Christians, which should give them and us encouragement and hope through difficult times. We'll see that in three points. God at work, the church at work, and Christ at work. So first, God at work. So, what I want to do in this point is look quickly at the greeting of this letter, and then I want to outline two doctrines from this text. 
Yes, theology. Boys and girls, theology is, is actually good for you. It'll make the WhatsApp group learning the catechism look lame, as cool as it is, if you know this stuff. We're going to look at divine persons and divine predestination. I'm going to be unapologetically a bit theological in this point, but then we will circle back and make, I hope, some good application from these doctrines. So, look with me at verse 1, if you will. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, what we have here is Paul's first greeting written in any of his inspired letters. And what you have all noticed I am sure is that Paul's name is not the only one listed. So why do we call this Paul's letter? Well, we can trust that he is the primary writer here, but he probably took some input from his companions, namely because, as we read in Acts 17, Silas or Silvanus helped him plant this church, and Timothy as we saw in Acts 18, and we'll get to in chapter 3 of this letter, was the one whom he sent to Thessalonica to encourage them and who brought back the good report to Paul. And so it makes sense that he would include their greetings here. But then second about this greeting line, for those of you who know your Bibles, what's missing from the way that Paul usually opens his letters. Do you see it? Paul Paul usually says something like, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus to the church at so-and-so. But here here there isn't any assertion of his office. And so we wonder why that is. And there's two suggestions. And the first one is that Since this is Paul's first letter, maybe he wasn't as confident in his official status yet. But in regards to that, we read in Galatians, written about the same time, a really strong statement, Paul, an apostle not from men nor through man, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father. So it's not an issue of confidence. So what is the other suggestion? The more likely option is that in contrast to most of Paul's other letters, in this situation, no one in Thessalonica questioned his authority as an apostle, unlike in Corinth, and there was no grievous problem, unlike in Galatia. So there wasn't a need to start on the authoritarian note like other instances. But the, the rest of this greeting is even more fascinating and brings us to our first doctrinal note, divine persons. And I want to ask you, LCPC, did you notice, did you notice how deeply Trinitarian this passage is? How fully the Trinity is incorporated into these verses. Did you notice how Paul linked the Father, Son, and Spirit to the substance of everything he discussed here? Because this passage is so important because it shows us how the earliest Christians were able to argue from, not for, the doctrine of of the Trinity. In other words, even before the New Testament was completed, the doctrine of the Trinity was in full use, and biblical writers were able to assume understanding of the Trinity when they addressed churches. And we see in these verses each of the divine persons distinguished, but also noted as divine and at work for believers. So the first paragraph, take note of this, the first paragraph of Paul's first letter is deeply Trinitarian. I think that's striking. 
And so, even in verse 1, we read, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, let me point out something really small, but really important to you. I'm going to be a bit technical. I'm going to give you a few details, and then I'm going to, the data, and then I'm going to draw it together. So hang with me for a moment. Look how it says in this phrase, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the Greek language is really precise, even with tiny words, and it's important that the word in only occurs once here. And so Paul did not write in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so th- this means he's trying to, to group this whole phrase together, and I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. But in case you think I'm, I'm just on about nothing, let me prove that, that this is a thing. Uh, look at verse 7. See how it says, in Macedonia and in Achaia? And it should have done that again in verse 8 too, but it left it out. But the point that the word in is repeated separates these places. Now, here's the point. In verse 1, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are bound together, namely, namely, here here it is, both persons are the singular source of grace and peace. The singular source. The fact that Paul binds Christ the Lord with God the Father as the source of grace indicates that they share in Godness. And yet this, this really rich, I, I won't do anything that heavy again tonight, but I do want to point out how this rich Trinitarianism is woven throughout these verses. Verse 3, Paul remembers the Thessalonians in prayer before God the Father for their steadfast hope in Jesus Christ. And let me ask you, why, why is it important that they hope in Christ. Paul was a Jew, and who is the only proper person in whom to find hope for the Jews? God. Psalm 37, or sorry, Psalm 39, 7. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Psalm 62, 5, for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. It's good to hope in Christ, Paul says, because Christ is God. And and then, of course, there's the Holy Spirit, who in this passage is the person who gives power to gospel ministry. Verse 5, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. The Spirit is the divine person who achieved success for Paul's gospel preaching in Thessalonica. He gave it power and worked full conviction of the truth of the gospel and the people who formerly served pagan idols. And moreover, verse 6, the Spirit worked joy in the Thessalonian Christians even though they were suffering. And so what we have here, again, in the first paragraph of Paul's first letter is a truly Trinitarian understanding of God. The first doctrine here is the divine persons of the Trinity clearly described, that So we should note our second doctrine, divine predestination. So I I know I've been a bit all over this text so far. I'm going to focus in now, and I'm going to outline the actual passage a bit more. So we've covered the greeting, and then Paul began a section of thanksgiving in verse 2. We give thanks, where he explained why 
he was encouraged to hear the good report about the Thessalonian Christians. He, he thanked God constantly in his prayers, verse 3, by remembering before God the Father the fruit of the Thessalonians' faith, love, and hope. Did you pick up that those were the, the three virtues from 1 Corinthians 13? And then, so he told us how he prays for them by remembering the fruits of their faith, love, and hope. And then he tells us why in verse 4 that he's thankful. Paul thanked God because we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And so, so Paul thanked God because he saw evidence of election among the Thessalonian Christians, namely that, that they had become Christians. As he said in verse 9, they turned to God from idols. The gospel landed with the power of the Holy Spirit, and people in this pagan city had believed in Christ. And the fact that people turned to Christ and that they continued to pursue holiness in the midst of oppression indicated to Paul that he could have confidence that the people of this church, by and large, were members of God's chosen people. I said, I, I want to note for you a really important implication of all this doctrinal talk, specifically about this doctrine of election. Our, our default today, is it not, so often when we think of the doctrine of election is to say, but, but how can I ever know if I am chosen? Or why would I do anything if I think I'm chosen? Those are the two ditches on the side of the road, so to speak, and it's easy to fall into either one of them. We can turn this doctrine into total abstraction, but look, notice how Paul uses it in this passage. He wanted the Thessalonian Christians to find comfort in this doctrine. Far, far from trying to send them into introspective doubt, Paul was trying to use his perception of their election to encourage them in a really difficult time. As they endured hardship, affliction, oppression, he said to them, remember how obvious it is to the rest of us that God has chosen you. And that means you will be equipped to endure this. So this, this biblical discussion of predestination doesn't allow for speculation on that end, but it also doesn't allow for open license in sin because God chooses his people. And, and do you see why from, from this passage? Do you see here how as Paul goes on to explain in this passage that the Thessalonian reception of the gospel and their pursuit of godliness is the reason that he has confidence that they're chosen? And this is on the one hand supposed to assure them in troubled times that they unshakably belong to God. And on the other hand, motivate them to continue in their imitation of godly examples. And so the second doctrine of this passage is divine predestination that is meant to give encouragement of God's love and exhortation to continue in holiness. God at work is the triune God who has chosen his people and is producing the fruit of election in faith and holiness in his elect. And it brings us to our second point, the church at work. 
So, in, in the first point, we were probably a bit heavy and a bit technical, but we looked at those two doctrines of the Trinity and election, but that theological foundation is really important, though, because it helps us to keep in mind that, that truths about God are at the heart of the Christian life. We, we will turn into bland moralists if we do not keep ourselves enamored with the glory of God. If we are not caught up in who God is, we're just people with rules. But it should excite us to see these ancient truths of the Trinity and election so clearly woven into our Bibles. And now on this point and the next, I want to turn to make some application from this passage. How do we start to make use of the things here? And in what way do these theological truths motivate us in the course of daily life? And so first, in this point specifically, I want to ask how this passage causes us, or should cause us at least, to check ourselves for sin. How might this convict us? And so we, we noted in the last point how Paul was convinced the Thessalonian Christians were among the elect because they had received the word of the gospel. And, and look with me, though, starting in verse 6, how he explained that the further evidence of how they received the gospel was that they became imitators of the apostles and the life of Christ to such a degree that, verse 7, they, quote, became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And so as we, as we see in verse 8, there, the report of their faith became well known throughout the whole region. And that should cause us to ask about what are our churches like? Now, because I'm new here, just three weeks into being part of this congregation, I can still get away with saying that this church, like the Thessalonians, has a really good report. And I mean, that's actually one of the reasons why it is so exciting to get to be here and participate in ministry. And I don't, I don't just mean sort of a local knowledge. When I've spoken with former professors in California, they, they know who London City Presbyterian is, and they want to visit. But, there's always the but. We can't simply leave it at our church broadly, has a good reputation, and we have to ask about our own lives. And so, I want each of you individually to ask, are you personally on board with the things in the life of this church that give it a good report? What, what's your stance towards all the things that we do here? Are, are you just glad that you have a place to go Sunday morning and Sunday night? Or are you glad there is a place to worship God in a way that accords with Scripture and prioritizes Bible preaching? Do you, do you think it's silly how much we pray that lost people would get saved and believe this? Or do you think that's serious business? Even, even if you're glad that there is good worship here, do you come to our prayer meetings? Because the quality of worship and the preaching here thrives on the support of prayer groups on Sunday nights, Thursday nights, and in midweek Bible studies. If you like the preaching here, you should be praying that it keeps going. And if you don't like the preaching here, you should be praying that it gets good. So are you engaged with the prayer ministry of this church? Are you trying to get around 
people of this church for encouragement and fellowship as much as you're able. And not just to tilt this to one side so that the people who are there get off. If you're there, are you encouraging people to come with you? To worship? To evening worship? To our prayer gatherings? Are you, or are you worried about annoying people? And so we remain silent. Because the reason why LCPC has a good report is because people have been committed to word and prayer, but that will not linger on the past work of others. Each one of you has to make that commitment your own as much as you are able, else we cannot assume that we will always be useful. But we want to be useful. The church at work is the gathering of God's people who are actively pursuing Him and seeking to advance His kingdom on earth, and we need to be participating in that endeavor. It brings us to our third point, Christ at work. So, in the first point, we considered two primary doctrines of this passage, divine persons, divine predestination. And then in the second point, we reflected on how this passage might cause us to think about our own witness in the world and how even though this church has a good report, we need to be personally involved in the things that bring it a good report. But now in this point, So that was the bad news. In this point, I want to think about how does this passage give us reason to rejoice? So I I told you in the introduction that the three major themes of this letter are the imitation of a godly example, the, the apostles and the Lord, the doctrine of election, and the return of Christ. And we've seen in this passage a focus on the Thessalonians' imitation of the apostles and the Lord as the cause of the good report. And we saw how that imitation, as well as the reception of the gospel, gave Paul confidence that the Thessalonians were elect. And now we want to think uh, about that last theme. So in verses 9 and 10, we find a treatment of the return of Christ and how he will be returning to rescue his people. And we all know, I would guess, that there are loads of notions about the return of Christ. And we will have the opportunity to discuss some of those as we move through First and Second Thessalonians, but the details need to wait. What we need to do here is look at the role that the return of Christ plays in this letter. So read with me verses 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, meaning the Thessalonians had received the gospel that Paul and his companions taught, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the Thessalonians had turned to God from idols to serve him and, and to wait for the return of the Son. Now, remember... Please, please remember, I mean, this is so crucial to get why this is important, that Paul is writing because, as we saw, these people are enduring much affliction. You receive the word in much affliction, he says. So, so the things he's writing here are meant to encourage people who are oppressed and who are struggling. 
And the return of the Son, therefore, is supposed to be good news. It's supposed to be something to sustain their hope. And I, I personally think that conflicts with a whole host of popular teaching, widespread ideas about the second coming. And, and here's the point. Here's the point. Paul intends the coming of Christ to give hope and comfort to Christian people. So, so if our understanding of the end of the world does not give hope and comfort to Christian people, then it's not biblical. So if you hear TV and radio so-called preachers and everything they have to say about Christ's return results in fear, then you know you've got to run the other way because it's not what the Bible intended to accomplish talking about the return of Christ. Christ's return should lift up our heads Christians and strengthen our backs so that we can press forward waiting the return of our Savior. It should be good news. So here's the, here's the, the question that I know you all have. Why? Why should Christ's return be good news? Why should that give me hope? And you can see the answer in verse 10, can't you? Jesus will come back to deliver us from the wrath of God. For for those who are in Christ, his return means total rescue from the effects of sin. How, how, How can we be certain of this? Well, We know we can depend on his rescue because the only reason he stands in heaven now is to plead our case. Hebrews 5 tells us, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, so if Christ was appointed to stand in heaven now to save you, how, how could he return with any other purpose? If he stands now to make sure that you're accepted in God's throne room, why would he come back except to save his people? If you are in Christ, if you hope in him, then you are assured of eternity. If you trust in Jesus, if you are made right in God's sight, justified, you are guaranteed eternity. Romans 5, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. There is no question what will happen to Christians on the last day. I don't care how popular someone is who tells you otherwise. If they try to add something of your works to your salvation, if you have trusted in Jesus, they are wrong. Paul says so. He has a trump card over every popular preacher. Christ at work is how Christ has shed his blood to wash away your failures and violations of his law and lived a perfect life to credit you as righteous. Christ at work is how he pleads your case before the throne of God so that you have a guaranteed place in heaven. So if there are any of you who don't trust in Jesus. You can be assured, you can be assured that Christ's return means that you are about to face the full wrath of God for eternity. So 
So then why will you not trust in him now? Why would you not come to him for rescue? Now is the moment to trust in Christ. Whether it's for the first time or even with renewed assurance that we all need every week, now is the moment to trust in Christ so that we can look forward to his coming with hope, knowing that the Son of God, the Son of God was raised from the dead so that he could raise you from the dead for life. Wipe away every tear and give you a hope, a home, and a family for eternity. Let's pray.